disciple, a disciple singing. It is the House of Sangofa with me, Umni Swemvu. Look what I got to move from before we move to Mzintu. Today we're with uh, someone very special in my life as I grew up. Um, I'm the muse of the house. 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 I'm the muse of the <laughs> and, and, and be uh, within the same uh, places and spaces, consuming just uh, the music of the day and what it uh, brought through. Uh, he's uh, one member, ladies and gentlemen, of uh, the collective called uh, Black Sunshine. His name is uh, Masawuko Chipembera. Masawuko, it's about time you came back, man. Hey, man, glad to be Welcome. here. Welcome. Glad to be here. If you remember, actually, the way I first was meeting you was you were, it was hip hop, and you were, we actually were competing for the same job, actually, at YFM, at YFM, that yeah. hip hop job, but you got the job, and I watched. That rap activity yeah, jam. Yeah, but you did a lot with it, man, right. respect, you did everything with it. So. It's so good to see you, I mean, I think it uh, must have been, what, two decades uh, plus since I'd seen you, because you just uh, packed up and uh, disappeared when you decided you're done, and you have to move to another corner of the world. Yeah, I mean, um, I had my first son around 2001, and then my, uh, my girl was in New York, was in Brooklyn, and it just made sense to be there where he was. After a while, I found myself, uh, how do I put it, lost. You know, you have children, and you kind of realize the children become the compass for you, so I had to go where... My, hap my son's Jabulani had to go where my happiness was. Yeah. I want to take it all the way back um, to Malawi, where the core is. We call it Inkaba, um, you know. And uh, the impact your father had in, in as far as uh, politics. Um, and I think somehow you didn't get into politics, but uh, your pen to pad um, game, I think, uh, is the real thing because you are able to reflect on life and social uh, issues. The impact your father sort of uh, had on uh, you, and I know you only had a, you know, a short span of time you know, to spend with the old man, but as one reads about him, uh, he was uh, quite uh, an upright man, uh, you know, uh, wanting to liberate his people in Malawi and so on and so forth. What can you tell us about Senior? To start off, my father, was a Pan-Africanist mind. He went to Fort Hare here um, in the 50s and was exposed to the beginnings of apartheid, which clicked in his consciousness. At that time, folks like ZK Matthews were there. And my father was very enamored with ZK and sort of looked at him as a bit of an idol. And my father was interested in politics, but what he saw happening here between 19, you know, 50, 52, um, made him absolutely sure he needed to go into politics. His first inclination, being a Fort Hare student, was to join the ANC Youth League. He was the first non-South African to join the ANC Youth League ever. <laughs> um, and he wanted to actually stay here because he was so angry with what he was seeing with apartheid. But because Z.K. Matthews was his mentor, one of his mentors, Z.K. Matthews told him, no, do not stay here. Take what you've learned here and seen here and take it back to Nyasaland. And when you go there, there's a federation happening now between Nyasaland and northern and southern Rhodesia. Nyasaland, of course, uh, yeah. being Malawi. Yes. It was known as Nyasaland, yes. And of course, the Rhodesias being Zimbabwe and Zambia now. But at that time, they were trying to federate them into one large state, which would kind of be an extension of the apartheid state. So the elders in the ANC were like, look, G.K. Matthews literally told him, if you go back and begin to fight that federation now, you're going to arrive at your liberation 
faster than we will in South Africa, which ended up being true. And my father did exactly that. If you go and read uh, Z.K. Matthews' autobiography, he says in there, Chip Mbede was one of our students that we were proud of because we sent him to go fulfill a mission, and he did so. And of course, uh, him and a handful of uh, guys were responsible for liberating uh, the people of uh, Malawi uh, from the grips of uh, you know, the British colonial rule. Mm, absolutely. There was others like uh, Kanyama Chiume, uh, the Ch Chiziza brothers, Rose Chibombo, uh, Orton Chirwa. All these names are names known to Malawians, but not so well known because our dictator, Kamuzubanda, who was the only black leader in all of Africa to op openly support the apartheid regime, made sure to cancel all the names of the Pan-Africanists who had attempted to be part of uh, the larger liberation of Africa. He focused in on what he could do for, let's say, just Malawi, but to the sacrifice of South Africans, uh, uh, black people in Mozambique. He was, uh, I'd say, you know, a bit of a traitor to the Pan-Africanist cause. And of course, uh, the relationship between uh, him and your father, I, I think at first it was good with Kamuzu Banda, but then uh, things just uh, sort of uh, descended, where in a way your father was expelled from uh, Malawi. Yes. He, if I was to make a long story short, essentially what happened was the young men decided that Kamuzu's methods were out of date. You know, the idea, Kamuzu felt like, well, if I don't make friends with South Africa, you know, how are we going to expand this country? And the young men felt as though, no, that time is over. We're not, we're not going backwards and connecting with the whites where they're going to, you know, neo-colonialist reality. No, we're not doing that. We're yeah. going all the way for liberation. Um, but unfortunately, and I don't know if this is true almost everywhere, where you have one group of young men under the man in power, there's always another group of younger men underneath those ones. Yes. And that third group is always willing to go up to daddy at the top and go, dad, <laughs> you don't need those guys in the middle. Just eliminate those guys. Yeah, yeah. We're here. Yeah. We'll do whatever you want. We'll run the mile for you. And that's sort of what happened in Malawi was that, that younger guys in the civil service yeah. decided to sell out their big brothers, which meant my father and all of those gentlemen had to go and with them, went the vision of the country because Kamuzu had been out of the country for 40 years. He was called back to lead the struggle simply because those young men, and this is an important lesson for all Africa right now, yeah. those young men were not trusted by the elders. They, the elders told them, ah, we don't believe that we can get free of the British unless we have an old man leading us. And so the young men literally, there's an old saying in Malawi that was, we need to get some gray hair. Basically, they went out and got Kamuzu because they needed a man with gray hair to lead. It wasn't necessarily the substance of what he was speaking or anything. And I say that to us now because we're a young continent right now. And in so many spaces, what's holding us back is the idea of old leadership that's not prepared for this new era. And that's what held us and back. And it's still happening now, yes. yes. Exactly. It's still exactly. happening now. He became some sort of a nomad going to the States, LA, I think. Um, in between it all, he was studying. Uh, but then um, had a little stint in Tanzania where he was teaching. Yes. Um, but was just all over the place um, until uh, his passing. Uh, and only when Kamuzu Panda was uh, you know, uh, uh, deposed of, uh, your mother then came back and uh, was in parliament. Absolutely. So our family was 30 years outside the country. I was, it's a long time, my son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was born outside the country. I was born in exile in Los Angeles, conceived in Tanzania while they were running from Kamuzu, born on the other side. My first trip on this side of the world was about 1996. I was 26 years old. Back when you were seeing me about 27, 28, I had just got here. Oh, okay. You know, I had just fresh. got here. Yeah, fresh off the boat, looking, you know, with my L.A. walk, everybody was like, bro, where are you from? I'm like, why? You walk like that. Looking nervous. Yeah. Like post, I had the post Rodney King blues and all that. Yeah. So I was, I was in that kind of consciousness. But yeah, we, we were a long time gone. The anguish of exile was to grow up away from family, um, not knowing grandmothers and aunts and uncles. The beauty of exile 
was that I happened to grow up down the street from Kaifa Semenya. And so... In L.A.? Yes. So he was my uncle. Till today, I still would call him Uncle Kaifas. He bought me my first record player because... Man! Yeah, because my... <laughs> His son, Mo, went to my mother's creche. And as Pan-Africanist people, he kind of knew who my father was yeah. and what that was about. My mother was understanding who they were and their relationship with Mary Makeba and everything. And so in L.A., we had this little kind of alcove of black conscious people. And Kaifis is the reason I became a musician, because as a kid, I'd go over and swim in his pool, and um, he'd be in the studio recording songs like Angelina, and they like to play with fire. So as a kid, I was hearing those things and watching him. And literally, one day when he came to the, the creche, he had a nice Peugeot. I asked my mom, what does that guy do? Because he has the pretty wife, and he drives the nice Peugeot. Like, what does he do? <laughs> yeah. And she said, He's a musician. he plays yeah. piano. Yeah. And I said, yeah, but I know that, but what does he do to get money? And she said, no, he plays piano to get money. And that was it, boom. I'm like, I'm going to be like him. Seed was planted, man. Yeah, the seed was planted. I tell you what, he's been on the House of Sankofa, and, he, you know, Max, we had budgeted on, on two hours. We ended up having two sessions with him right here on the House of Sankofa, four hours each. Yeah. Because he, he, he just unleashes. Yeah, and he's a history book. He has it all, yes. all the information from both sides of the ocean, mind you. Indeed. Because at that time, when I was a kid, he was working with Quincy Jones. Yeah. yeah on the soundtrack to Roots. So you have to understand, like, the way I'm understanding music is, oh, here's an African guy who's a producer from South Africa, and he's working with Quincy Jones, who's the biggest, like, producer from here. This is before he's done Michael Jackson, right? But as a kid, you're watching these interactions, and it's going into me as a young person des desire desiring to be an artist. Oh, yeah. This confluence is kind of ends up inside of my music, I think, yeah. So, so by the time you land back here within the African continent, uh, you don't go to Malawi, but you land in South Africa. No, I went to Malawi. You went to Malawi first, yeah, right? Yeah. It was rough. It was rough. Yeah, because why was, was it so rough? Because it was just after Kamuzu had been pushed out of power. All right. And my mom had been missing for a while. Like, we couldn't reach her for a period of time. Yes. So they said, somebody has to go to see mom. And me being high on hip hop and the Jungle Brothers and everything, they're like, who wants to go to Africa? I want to go to Africa! <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And everybody, my brothers and sister at the table, like, is he crazy? What's going on? I'm high on Chuck D and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I was the first one to come and uh, went to see mom in Malawi. It was rough. It was still an old school Malawi, a Malawi where in 1994, you have to remember, a woman couldn't enter the airport unless she had a dress below the knees. If she did not, they would give her that dress in the airport before she could enter the country. If a man had hair down his back, locks or whatever it is, they'd cut your hair at the airport before you could come into the country. This was till 1994. So by the time I'm showing up 96 or so, it's still pretty, you know, super conservative. And I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a wild man compared to what's going on in Malawi at that time. Now, it's moves. I'm yeah. a normal person in Malawi now. It's beautiful then, now. Yeah, it's cool now. But it wasn't like that then. But I mean, socially, there's still a lot of challenges, just like any other African country that's been devastated by colonialism. Yeah? Mm, mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Malawians love to laugh. So, like, I was sitting they're in the car. They're the most hospitable people they're, I've uh, ever interacted with. Which is just hospitab yes. hospitality. It's yes. just something amazing. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and that's also, I think, why we get our butt whooped, you know? Mm by our political class is that we're, we're kind by nature. I was in a car the other day and I looked in the back seat and one guy's laughing and then the other girl starts laughing and then the other one starts laughing and I'm like, then what I do you start got? laughing. I'm like, what do you, what, are you, what are you guys laughing about? Yeah. And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, we're in one of the poorest countries in the world and you're laughing for no reason. Like, that's beautiful though. I'll take it. Because I come from another part of the world where like, we don't laugh, you know? So there's something about that that's beautiful that I love about Malawi. There, there, there seems to be a trend in, in, in regards to Malawi, and, and Madonna's the one that's just highlighted uh, this of uh, Americans, Europeans, coming to adopt children. What's that, what's that about? Well, if you're in a country that has historically brutalized black people for yeah. hundreds of years, yeah. and 
those black people are angry, which they righteously should be because you kept them from reading and kept them from being able to receive the fruits of their own labor for hundreds of years. When you won't finally want a kid, it makes sense to get one from the other side of the world where the particular guilt isn't the same. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, um, and I guess there's a slight feeling that you're doing something about this race thing when you get a kid who's black, right? But in a way, it's cheating the code because who needs that help are the people who's, <laughs> whose families you oppressed for hundreds True. of years. Why not give that help right there? Why you got to go all the way to Africa? I can show you a kid from the south side of Chicago who needs adoption. It's safer. It's safer. There's less questioning. And we're very friendly in Malawi again. You know? Too friendly sometimes, as you, friendly. As you put it. Yeah. 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 And then you land in SA, and uh, you, know, you, you land in a period where there's a euphoria in as far as our political uh, freedom was just uh, attained. There's music bubbling. There's, there, there's Guaito. They, they are poets, young poets, expressing themselves. The likes of Perm as a collective, you know, um, Dumi, who now goes by the name of Stogie T. <laughs> Lebu Mashile had just come back as well from the States. And you immerse yourself in that uh, culture, and we were a part of, and uh, you, you're auditioning for my job as well that I got. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Because it was right at the center of the culture. It, it was in the center of that culture. I mean, it, it must have just been something special for you to be landing at that time, Masoko. Absolutely. That time was special. In Yeovil, it was special, right? Because Yeovil was the center of the culture for the young people who don't know. Um, you know, it was like living in a building where like Tandiswo lived over here. Yeah. And then, you know, um, Ghetto Rough was down the street. The whole label was there. So Ishmael and then we were around. Boom Shaka. Boom Shaka. All these people mm. were around. These were people that you were seeing in the street, in the market, you could run into, those days you could run into Miriam Makeba in the supermarket, yes. you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was like a, like a time that, out of a dream, but the cool thing is, we knew it while it was happening. Yes. It wasn't one of those times where like people, are, you know, they're, they're in another headspace and they just assume, no, we actually lived and appreciated the moment. We knew this is special. This particular moment is incredibly special, you know? So. I'm happy, like, all the, all the heads from that time have found their own way and their own creativity and their own identity within the arts and so forth. And, you know, you can't beat that because, you know, it's harder today, I think, you know, to, to, to be seen and heard. Yeah. I mean, in most cases, I, will see, I would see you in, in the more creative spaces, whether it's poetry joints, you know, doing your thing, whether you're solo. And then uh, came the interaction with uh, Nail. Um, and you formed Black Sunshine. How did that happen? Where did you stumble upon uh, Neo, uh, whom I think is, is just a space cadet? He's just, he's always just trying to test his limits, isn't it? Yeah. yeah? He, he's, his, he's his own person. Yes. And that's what drew me to him in the beginning. I first heard Neo at Janitos at Monday Blues. I remember Janitos. Yeah, yeah. Which is where everybody, I met my wife Peter, at Janitos. Peter Makuruba used mm -hmm. to run that. May so yes. rest in peace. Yeah. Yes. Peter Makarube was the first person to ever interview me in South Africa because he knew who I was before I did. Peter looked at me and went, you're Chippenbetter's son. Do you know who that is? Let me show you. And he brought me down uh, Second Avenue by Impalele and he showed me, look here, this is Impalele was walk, running around Tanzania yes. trying to find your father yeah, yeah. because of who your father was in the struggle. And I'm just there with my jaw dropped sort of confused. He's like, so you being here is way more important than you know, because your struggle is tied to all of these things that are going on here. So Monday Blues was my first stop where I really met folks. Within that month, I met Nell Muyanga, I met my wife, Natasha, I met Busim Klongo, I met Becky Koza, I met all of these people who would later go on to influence me as an artist it was a hub. in every single way. But Muyanga was playing on the stage. He was playing, um, one day he was playing Born in a Taxi, actually. Yeah. And I looked to Natasha, who would later become my wife, and I said, that guy has a hit song. That's a hit record. And she was like, you think so? I'm like, I'm absolutely sure that's a hit record. I want to play with that dude. So I came in knowing this guy's got some stuff. It wasn't a, you know, 
we found out later. I walked in knowing You that. sort of felt it from the performance, right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. you didn't know him from a bar of soap until you, yeah. you stumbled upon him, I guess, uh, at uh, Janito's Monday Blues. Yeah. Yes. Now, I was coming from L.A., though, and I'd already had a record contract with RCA Records in L.A. I'd been signed, a, like, a couple times in L.A. to different sort of labels. So I had an ear for, like, what, what was going to get out there and work in multiple genres. Um, that's something I think people don't always know about me, is I came here with a lot of experience on the other side. So you already had chops. <laughs> I, already had, I had already been inside the music industry. I'd already, at 19, I'd recorded um, in the same studio where Michael Jackson recorded in L.A. And that's, again, I got fast-tracked because I'd seen Kyphus and all those people when I was seven, eight years old. So, and I'd seen a real studio by the time, in his house, by the time I was, you know what I mean? So I was in the, the big studios, uh, in a and Studio A, by the time I was like 19 years old. So did then the collective, did it just happen organically? Or there was a meeting to say, man, listen, I'm, I'm digging your vibe, your energy. Um, yes. Let's pursue this. Absolutely. I, I met with him. I'd asked Becky about him. Becky said, he doesn't really seem that, Becky Coza said, Becky I don't Cosa. know if he's so sure about being a musician because he works at 702. And I was like, yeah, oh, but he I... He was an engineer or producer there, right? Yeah, Something and like that. I was doing some, some of that. Yes. Exactly. Now, for me, I come from a place, for you young musicians, listen closely to this. I come from a place where the guy who's serious about music is the guy who has a job. And he's got the job so he can make the music that he wants to make instead of making music every single day, running here, running there, so running. he could be flipping burgers. Yeah, you might flip burgers so he can buy the beat machine he wants or whatever. So I had to check with Nell to find out, okay, here they're telling me you're not serious because you don't play music full time. And then when I went and asked him, like, you know, what's up? He's like, no, I, I have a job so I can do the music I want to do. I don't want to do everything. And I said, okay, boom, same consciousness I'm in. So then we just decided to get together and play guitars. And once we did, once we were playing, like it was nine months before we looked up. I don't even know if he knew my surname or I knew his. We just got in the room. We didn't say much. Sure. Those guitars came out and we were gone. You recorded. You know what I mean? And just playing, 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 playing. It wasn't a, oh, you know, how's your mom? How's your this? You know, nah. It was none of that. Guitars, go. Let's go. Boom. And that's it, you know? And I needed someone like that, and I think he did too. Because people think a lot of this music thing or whatever is chatty, 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 chatty. No, it's more of like when you're serious, it's to shut up and play. Let's just let's get inside the music where the spirit is and leave everything else out. And that's how I'd seen you um, in many of your shows that you you guys be doing, whether you are at uh, Melville at the baseline or you are at an art gallery playing somewhere, 206, I remember. You remember 206, man? <laughs> uh, both of you would almost just be in this, I don't know, in a state where I look at the pair and, and it almost looks like you guys are in another realm. Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's there. It's, a, it's definitely, you know, the black sunshine thing the sun in it uh, was always us understanding it was a bit of an ancestral mission. We did understand clearly like this is a moment that we are in and it's our job to kind of shine a light on a new direction. We, we understood we were doing that. Um, and it came about organically, but we're both conscious people. We're both people who, as artists, we're both artists who are like, oh yes, but we've read Osman Sembene and you know Bessie Head or whatever we kind of deal with ourselves more as intellectual people just than artists There's some other guy who just plays but he's not concerned with like the relationship between Kwame Nkrumah and Lumumba we are you know what I mean yeah. and, and and then the, the the iconic album is born Black Sunshine and it, it just took us by storm I was, uh, besides the Rap Activity Jam, the hip-hop show, I was doing a show um, on YFM uh, dedicated to poetry. Used to call it word of mouth. And that's where I'd, uh, you know, within the circles I would uh, be seeing various uh, poets. There was Dorian Fontaine, uh, where there was a poetry club as well, and you guys would visit there, here and there. But when I first heard the album, it just blew my mind. And as you say, I kind of get the essence now that you just went into studio and go. 
uh, no, hey, <laughs> you know, how's your mom, how's everything? You just went. Um, had you already written some of the songs? We had written all of that material. Um, we had been performing it for quite a while, which is a blessing because you, you know a song from the inside and out when you've li lived with it. Yeah. Um, and then we had, I had been blessed when living in LA to have met a guy named Russell Pope, who Russell Pope is an old school, he's actually South African. This is what's crazy. Russell Pope. Russell Pope, he's South African. Is he black, is he white? He's a white guy. Right, okay. Before I ever knew I was coming to South Africa, I had met a guy on the other side named Russell Pope who became my manager. He had come from working with a group called Supertramp. Supertramp was a mega million selling group that did kind of pop in the style of the Beatles. And he became a mentor to me, which kind of allowed me to know a lot about the studio because he was considered a sort of studio genius. Yes. So when Nell and I, even when I met Nell, I was trying to stay inside of a formula I had learned from Russell. Russell had taught me that you want to have two songwriters in a group that can inspire each other, push each other forward, compete a little bit, but also contribute to each other's stuff, which was the Beatles formula. And so when I heard Nell doing Born in a Taxi, my mind was like, that's the guy. He's got the songs, he's got the stuff, like he'll be, he's, where, he's equal to where I am, his voice is interesting, between the two of us, something special can happen. But the first album was recorded in, I think, one of the Jackson's studios in Los Angeles, uh, yes. House of Blues studio, um, and it had formerly been one of the Jackson studios. And we were able to be there because of Russell. So we did not start, like, organically from the bottom, really. We had someone who's, who, behind us, who was like, had sold millions of records and chose to work with us because he believed in what we were doing. He also, Russell told me once that his father was a strict sort of Africana type that knew who my father was. Man, so, how's that? <laughs> yeah, so he, yeah. He, he said to me, yeah, if my father knew I was working with you and who your father was, he, he, he would break everything in the house because your father's name, when I was a kid, when your father's name got mentioned, it sent Tara through my dad because in, in South Africa, they could control what people were saying, but you couldn't control what somebody was saying from Yasaland. So the Afrikaners possibly saw your father as a terrorist, um, a communist, that kind uh, of thing. All of that, yeah, yeah, all of yeah, that. Yeah. And the loudest mouth because he's there knowing what happened with apartheid because he's been here, but he's able to speak about it from Nyasaland where they can't necessarily just grab him. So he became probably one of the loudest voices in the region against apartheid, principally because being outside allowed him to speak. And fate you know? puts you together with this gentleman. Fate put me together with this gentleman <laughs> who was very conscious of the idea that, yeah, I'm glad I'm doing this because my father was one of those whites in South Africa who treated people poorly. So it was, yeah, there's no accidents at all. Then him and Nell met and they were quite, in a way they're kind of similar, very quiet, very artistic, creative people. And once the three of us were together, a lot of interesting things started happening in the universe because it almost felt like this white man's ancestors and our ancestors were trying to figure out like, how are we gonna work this out? <laughs> you know Some sort of a reconciling yeah. ritual that you were doing yeah. in studio as you were recording, mm. I guess, yeah? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And Russell brought his A game to it and he funded the whole first album. He paid for that album. So rest in peace, Russell Pope, you know, give thanks for your contribution. You keep talking about Born in a Taxi and how it blew you away. Um, there are other gems within the album. I mean, all of the album for me is just fantastic. Building, you did building, you came in with building. And it was just a super, you know, uh, a song where you just opened up to just what's happening, you know, around us, right? How did that come about? Here's what's interesting. I wrote that in LA before I ever came to SA. It felt African. <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing. Yeah. Like I said, I had been literally building towards getting to South Africa in the sense that my life had put me in a community. The same community that like Kamasi Washington is coming out of and Kendrick Lamar comes out of and all of that, I was in that community in LA. We call it, uh, you know, um, Little Africa, which is Lamert Park. Lamert small, Park, yeah, okay. Small little region of LA where the black people come together and celebrate Africa. So 
there I had been beginning to learn about Africa. To be honest, Willy Hosatsile actually came and read at the world stage and for, in like 92. So I was able to hear him too. So this whole kind of consciousness was coming into me from lots of places. And at a certain point, I'd had a poetry reading with some friends in LA that went beautifully. And afterwards, I had this feeling that like we could do just about anything. And that's where the song came to me, We Grow From Seed to Tree, Me and My People Building. Now, when I wrote that, I was thinking universally about black folks. I'd already been in that consciousness where it's like, what's happening in South Africa is similar to what's happening in LA, to what's happening in Zim. I, I'd already seen that. But when I arrived here with that song, they went, we see you. In LA, they didn't, one part of the town saw me. The other part of town was like, nah, nah, be quiet with that. I got here and universally everyone was like, that's our song. And it felt great for me because finally a certain kind of conscious music I'd been creating in LA, which the system kind of despised, was immediately embraced in South Africa in a way where later on that was like a number one song on P4 radio. So like the idea of singing a revolutionary song that could be number one on, in, on the radio in LA in the 90s, that was not going to happen. We were rolling down the street smoking endo, sipping on gin and juice. You understand? <laughs> in LA, yeah. Yeah, but I got here and all of a sudden it, it was like, yeah, it, even Mandela and um, Mandela used it for a certain campaign that he was doing. And, yeah. yeah. Um, Mandela and Tutu together. So it was like, I went from your music doesn't make sense to, oh, it makes sense to us. And maybe that's ancestral. Maybe that has to do with dad. Yeah. Maybe that has to do whatever. But it was like right place, right time. We grow from seed to tree, me and my people building. What a gem of a gem. Maybe you could remind us of it, man. <laughs> Maybe you can, you know. On our soft sankofa, Masauke Chipimbera. This one is called Building. Sung very close to my heart. It goes like so. A disciple singing songs of revolution. The circle of the drums keep ringing louder for the spirit. Awake now, it's love we're bringing in the form of freedom. Come down now, of the people singing. We grow from sea to tree. Me and my people building. Me and Malawi. Me and my people building. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> oh man! <laughs> Masoko Chipembere. This is uh, the house of Sangofa. And of course, uh, blessing us with that great gem of a song, uh, Building. <sighs> there was Basalifi that Neo sang as well. Just touring with uh, the music. How did you find the crowds were sort of engaging with the music you were giving them at the time? Man, um, I felt like people, we fed each other, the crowds and ourselves, because we're all in the same moment kind of praying for a transformation and living yes. a transformation. So at that time, the music kind of felt like it belonged to the people and we were just vehicles to convey it. You know what I right. mean? Right. There was multiple times when we were on stage where, you know, we might perform and the people would start singing along. Yeah. And it would almost feel as though the people were, it was like their song. Yeah. And we were just participating in their song. Right. Know? Sometimes to the point where you, we almost had tears on stage, you know, it was a bit overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, and as you're talking, born in a text, someone's phone is ringing and it's born in a text. It's the ringtone. I love it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought I heard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> born in a taxi. Um, and then you just disappear, man. Um, and there you are, gone. And I'm hearing Neo is doing uh, some work. I um, mean, as far as film scoring, coming in and out of the country, Cape Town based. Um, there you were, gone. Of course, uh, you know, the children were, were born and yet to rear the children. But you spent some time in New York, Brooklyn, uh, at a museum, doing AV. Yeah. Tell me about that period of time. In New York, I always tried to have the kind of work that let me understand the culture better. I always wanted to be at the center, so two jobs I had. One, I worked in, in Kiru Books. In Kiru Books was the store owned by Mostaf and Kwali, the bookstore. Okay. And um, I got that job performing at an event he had called Foundations. Uh, Talib was running. And he liked what I was doing and sort of felt like when they went on their first tour with Black Star, he was like, you know, it would be good to have you run Foundations because you're more of an international character. And we're now looking to kind of make sure we have more folks from different places coming in. Bigger old school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that was one job, and there, I, you know, working in the bookstore gave me access to books. You know, I was reading uh, Octavia Butler, finding out about Afrofuturism. Um, I was studying Walter Rodney, how Europe underdeveloped uh, um, Africa, getting into books by Bessie Head and all that, because I've always been a person who believes that an artist must study. You know, art is intellectual activity. If you don't take in information, you'll have nothing real to offer people. So later on in Brooklyn, I started working at the Brooklyn Museum of Art as an audiovisual technician, which allowed me to kind of be in under, behind the scenes as an engineer for various shows. Um, I remember doing one where Jay-Z had put out a book and it was Jay-Z and Charlie Rose. I did another one with Most Deaf and I believe the, 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 maybe the, the chef who passed away um, not so long ago. Nordin, something like that. You guys know him better than me. But then um, also Gloria Steinem. I worked in the feminist center there, which made me exposed to tons of uh, second wave feminism and kind of understanding all the complexities of feminism, which is important to me. I like knowing things. I don't like to, you know, we're in a world where people are just kind of go, ah, feminism, blah, 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 and throw it all out. But there's multiple levels of it. And when I was working there, I learned about Alice Walker's understanding of womanism, which is different than people's concept of feminism, and the idea that black feminists may have a totally different agenda than white feminists and ages. And so in the art environment, I'm consistently at school. 
And it doesn't matter to me whether I'm the artist on the stage or behind the stage, because to me, artists are people who are in service. You were saying that, uh, you know, it gave you sort of both ends, you know what I mean, of uh, the stick. Um, in most cases, you were behind, but uh, you have been exposed to the stage where you're in front. But then when you're behind uh, doing technical work, uh, you have some sort of a consideration for the artists or artists who are in front there. So you get what's going on, holistically. Oh, oh absolutely. I remember um, the evening with Most Deaf, whoever the cook was that evening had said, he wasn't coming out unless everybody could taste this one sample of his food. And the audience was in an auditorium where food was not allowed. So like we're at, we had an impasse where all of a sudden the whole show wasn't going to happen if people couldn't have food. So I just kind of went to the, the lady who was running things and went, how bad would it be for them to have something to eat? Because like we're going to, we're, what's going to happen? Everyone's going to go home, you know? And she kind of calmed down and kind of went, okay, tonight we're going to break the rules and do it. And it was the most incredible show. One of the things I remember from that night is somebody asked Most Deaf, like, how do you stay in touch? You know, you're, you're an MC who never seems to, like, get lost in it. Like, how do you stay in touch with the core of what it is you do? And he said, he said, I started doing this in small rooms, just me and the homies. And there was a certain energy in those small rooms. Now I do this in gigantic places. But whenever I'm in those gigantic places, I'm always trying to capture the same energy of those small rooms. Profound. Yeah, which is me when I'm on a stadium somewhere, I'm thinking of like, how do I make this whole stadium feel like Janitos? How do I make it feel like Supper Club? So in a Supper Club or Janitos, you know, if, if a drink tips over, it becomes a joke. We just laugh it off, whatever. It's the same in that giant space. Don't get lost in the hugeness of it. What mattered the whole time was the intimacy, you know? So even when I'm behind the scenes, I'm learning, you know what I mean? And it's all an education for, for these moments, you know? And of course, behind, besides uh, your experience at uh, the muse museum with, uh, you know, books and, and literature, you got into art, man. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I got, there was nights I spent uh, when they had a huge Basquiat exhibit. Yes. And I would just spend, the museum would be closed, and I'd just sit in there for hours staring at his art, sometimes just kind of sitting with him. You know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. he's coming out of the walls through this art. You'd feel like yeah. he's present, yeah. Yeah, and you, know, you begin to really understand multiple levels of what that man was doing, the ancestral level, the music level, the jazz level, the hip-hop level, all of that's going into his art, and if you move by quickly, you don't see it, but if you sit there for a while, and then even the little writings in there, all of a sudden he'll be like, you know, Mississippi Delta, and then he'll be like, Delta Egypt, and da 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 da, and he'll make these connections where it's like, oh, he's seeing us as a people around the world. No, no different than what I'm visioning in music. Yeah. He was visioning it through visual art. So, yeah, consistently, um, Wangechi Mutu stuff was in there, I sat with that stuff, I worked with her. You know, quietly, she didn't know she was working with an artist, but I did all her sound and everything, and she was super cool, but got to see how she thinks about her space and everything. So, yeah, consistently, being around art inspires art. That's, you know, especially for me, like, I'm a person who, I'm always conscious of what we're doing. If you look at the first Black Sunshine album cover, and then go look at, let's say, the work of uh, an artist like Romir Bearden, a collage artist, um, Nico was looking at his work, we were looking at his work. We're aware of that stuff. It's not happening by accident. We care about art all around. Nail's serious about art all around. I mean, I remember one or two of your shows um, when there was an artist <laughs> on stage besides you. You, know, you were busy on your guitars and performing. The usual songs that we'd sing along to. But then I realized that there's an artist next to you, um, Nico Poco. Don't know whether you remember him. He used I to talk to him yesterday. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, I'm yeah. calling him today. Yeah, he 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 had a black canvas, you know, and the room was so rather dark, and he used to I don't know paint with bleach, so you you you'd see him doing all these strokes on this black uh, canvas, and when this thing dries out, then the images of you and Masauko 
sort of come out mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. sort of towards the tail end of your show. I thought yeah. that was beautiful. The album cover, the first album cover was made at a show. Yes. Yeah, it was made at a show. He uh, is part of the posse, you know, like Nico is part of Black Sunshine. All three al album covers, both the Black Sunshine album and my solo album cover were all made by Nico. We already got plans for another one by Nico. Um, you know, that was something, again, I'd seen some of that going on in New York. Oh, I Saul see. Williams was doing that um, uh, with, as, what he, with his poetry. Yeah. And his, the mother of his first child, they used to do it together. I'm forgetting her name right now, which is terrible. We're friends getting older. But um, she used to paint. And so I saw that and went, we got to try that. And we kept, brought, did it in South. And it's kind of interesting with two guitars doing it. It's a little different than poetry, you know. And Nico, of course, responds to music because he's a jazzy guy. First time I met Nico, it was at the movie Jump something. Do you remember this? There was like a, a movie. Basketball movie or something? No, it was no? like a late 90s movie that they were showing here. It was one of the first South African movies. I think it was the white director that was oh, going out. Oh, I see. Okay. But either way, Nico was in the theater and he was walking towards the bathroom and I was coming out of the bathroom and he was whistling Sting's English Man in New York perfectly. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, who's this dude whistling <laughs> Sting in the toilet? Like, what, what is this kind of African? And this thing, he's whistling this thing precisely. Yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. like, I'm like, I got to know that dude. So I made yeah. a mental note. And then I think I ran into him later like, yo, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a visual artist. And from there, you know, a friendship ensued, yeah. But it started with him whistling sting, high art, into art. Yeah. I mean, when you walked in, I'm thinking, you know, you're coming fresh from the States. And you say, hey, brother Paul, I'm in Costa Rica now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Settled, the kids have uh, grown up and out of the nest. You made that move uh, to Costa Rica. Why that move? Uh, we were living in the States at the time period where Obama was ending and Trump was coming in. My wife and I are studiers of history. So we understood in the States, there's a book by W.E.B. Du Bois called Black Reconstruction. Yeah. And he deals with the idea that after slavery ended, as soon as black people got a little bit of freedom, there was a respite, white response to that freedom that was disproportionate, and they did everything to push them down. And so historically, that's been the cycle, right? As soon as black people get a little freedom, then the oppression comes at 10 times the, the, the you know. So when Obama was leaving, we understood, oh, when this guy Trump comes back in, we're back to an apartheid reality, back to a, a fascist kind of push. We understood that was coming. Historically, it was, it was almost a mandate. It's like a reflex. You hit here, boom, it kicks up, you know? So, yeah, we said, let's get out of here because we don't want us, our kids to see what's coming next. And we were 100% right. As uh, Tennessee Hussey coach said, Trump was the first white president. Why? Because he's the first person ever voted in simply because he was white. The f guy before him was black, so it was like, now we need a white guy, all caps. And Trump <laughs> okay. played that role. You know? Right. So we had to get out of there. We had to get away. And from have you it. found a sanctuary in uh, Costa Rica? Yes. Costa Rica is a place with no army. Yeah. Um, Costa Rica is a place where it is illegal to sell toy guns to children um, or to anybody. They don't have toy guns in Costa Rica. I remember asking one day. In the States, you buy a gun at a supermarket. Yeah. You can buy a squirt gun. You can buy a gum made out of a gun. You can buy, you know, a gun for your shower to squirt you like there's always a gun, you know? Costa Rica is the opposite. They don't want that for their children. They don't want that around. And it reflects. You, you see children getting to be children. And I wanted my kids to have that experience because I didn't. I grew up in LA where it was like, ah, oh, okay, you come out the door, there's bullets flying. It's that kind of reality. They didn't see that and it reflects in who they are, you know? The thing I want you to know too is, we weren't lying when we made our music. When I made a song, I made a song called Finger Painting a Masterpiece. Kids grow up strong and free, finger painting a masterpiece. Strong and free, strong and free. My daughter's name is Aminata, it means strength. Um, I wasn't planning on making those songs and then leading another kind of lifestyle. The song said, I'm trying to be a good dude and figure this out and you know, put some good energy into the world and that meant I gotta go be a good dad. I gotta figure that out. My dad died when I was small. 
So I didn't have a good map for that. It's like, this is what I need to figure out. It's true to the music. Seed to tree. These children are my seeds. I got to raise them up to that tree. And they're trees element. now, right? Yeah, they're there now. They're, 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 you know, ready to do everything that they're supposed to do in the world. So, like, my success is the fact that, to me, what I said I was trying to do in the music is what I manifested in reality. That's success to me. So, and you're obviously uh, here for a show. It's almost like a homecoming with you and um, Neo, and that's why, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you see him here. Um, it's a show that they'll be having at uh, the Untitled uh, Basement, and yeah, the tribe looks forward to it, man. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we got a whole tour. We're going around the whole country. Yeah, it's you know, a whole tour. Yes, we'll be after we do the Untitled Basement on Thursday. Yeah, we're going to the chairman in Durban for the 25th and the 26th of November. Then you can find us in um, Cape Town uh, on the 12th at uh, the Wave Theater. Yeah. And then we'll be coming back for a show at the Soweto Theater on the 14th of December. Of December. Yeah. Soweto Theater, yeah. 14th of December. Because Untitled Basement is sold out. You're going to miss that. <laughs> so, <you're gonna laughs> so, so Soweto is so so, the next stop if yeah, you are uh, in and around uh, Gauteng, I guess. Yeah? yeah. Come to Soweto Theater. Right. We're really looking forward to it. It's a Thursday night, but that mm. Friday, yeah. everybody has off now. So that Thursday has become a bit of a Friday. So there you are. Come there through. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Two albums under your belt as a collective, yes, right? Two albums as well. Uh, Black, Black Sunshine, Sunshine Self Titled, and Good Life. Yes. Yeah, and you've got one. I've got one. On Nail's got a solo album too. Nail's and got, I yeah. Got one, and I think he has another like EP or solo album too. Yeah. You have two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may have two actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there a consideration to possibly put a third album together as Black Sunshine? Yeah, we've already started recording. We have um, probably five songs done. A few of them will be playing um, tomorrow night. So, uh, and, uh, and then there's other things I'm working on. I just finished a record. Well, I don't say it that way, but me and Snaz have done an album. Snaz the dictator. He walks in here with Snaz, you know, the, the dictator, the rapper who, who used to grace the Rap Activity Jam back at uh, YFM. Um, Snaz is in his 40s and he's still got his skateboard. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. And we were saying injuries. Yeah. And I said to him though, but, but I respect this because the passion you have. I used to see him uh, in, in the Oval kicking and pushing and uh, sliding between buses as, as he was moving you know, on Rocky Street, right? Well, I mean, ultimately, we're trying to find a balance between the things that we were true to as young people and what we need to be true to now. Um, our mission together has been an album called Educated Man. And it started when I, I sent him a beat and the first thing he did uh, was create a chorus from the old Jungle Brothers song, Educated Man from the Motherland, yeah. which was my beginnings in hip hop. That was the first stuff that I really loved. Again, they were pointing me, I wouldn't have ever got to Africa without the Jungle Brothers, without a tribe called Quest, without all those guys kind of going, hey man, it's cool to be from Africa. Because in the States, before that, anybody who grew up there will laugh because they'll remember this. If you came from Africa, they'd be like, ah, you're an African booty scratcher. Oh man. No one understood what was different about Africans scratching their butts than anybody else. But for some reason, whatever it came on the playground, you know, and you just, you beat somebody in basketball, or whatever, ah, African booty scratcher. You know, so there was this whole negativity, and the hip hop is what you know brought the positivity. So Snaz and I have kind of made a record that I feel goes to the roots of the old school. Yet at the same time, the new school approach is that we feel kind of like, as men, it's time for a more sober approach. It's time for a more thoughtful understanding of fatherhood. It's time for us to get into some transformation. Especially um, at our ages, we're mellowing down now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As an artist, I feel like I'm more clear on what I want to say than I ever have been. And naturally, the system is set up to make sure at this age we don't get heard. But I finally feel like I know exactly what I want to say to people. And so. Yeah, perhaps we're not cool enough, man, at this age. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say, but I still think I can make music better than y'all. Because <laughs> I've, yeah. I've been doing this for a long, 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 long time now. And I came up in an era where I looked up at Oliver Mtukudzi and I respected him because he'd been doing this a lot longer than me. 
I looked at Hugh Masekela, he'd been doing this a lot longer than me. And when I met, you know, some of these cats like Hugh, they would encourage us and kind of, you know, tell us to stay focused and, you know, what aspect might, you know, push us forward and so forth. But there was always a reverence for those artists that came before me, Busum Klongo. Um, and so I feel like as someone who came through hip hop, hip hop is trying to say, nah, we're not into revering those who came before us. We're not doing that. And there's times when hip hop is my culture and there's times when it's not. It's not in that sense. I don't believe in the worshiping of gray hair, like, like I said earlier, but I do believe that uncle got something to offer and we need to listen to uncle. That's always been our culture in Africa. Oh yeah, always, and, and, right? And, and we don't need to get rid of that now. There's too many things that we've gotten rid of trying to impersonate what hip hop has to offer when Africa is the adult in the room all the time. The oldest people in the world are from right here where we are. I like that. Africa is the adult in the room. All the and time. And it's always been. Always. Yeah. Always. So if you're into hip hop culture, what I want to know is what are you bringing from your African culture into it? Because we need it. Why would Africa Bombada come here and cr go to Durban and create a Zulu nation unless he understood from the very beginning there's something in these cultures that we don't have and have lost on the other side. We need to learn from what's here. Right now we've been in a consistent situation where the student is the teacher. Now, now it's time for the teacher to teach and the students around the world to catch up. It's, it's Africa time now. It's our time. I bumped into um, the, the nephew of uh, Bra Hugh Masekela. Mabusha. Mabusha, yeah, yeah, the joy of jazz. He was doing the sound there. And, Smart guy. And the man, you know, still on it. Um, and humbly so. I mean, he's, uh, he's good at what he does but he's, he's bringing in these young ones and showing them how to do it. It was so good to see Mabusha, you yeah. know? And that's what we need, that's yeah. what we need. We have to pass down these skills. I just did a training session for girls in Malawi, 15 young girls teaching them about songwriting, music production. They've never done anything like that in Malawi because in general, women only have 3% participation in the whole music industry in Malawi. So a particular sister, Tammy Mbendera, who ran uh, helped run bushfire for years, went back to Malawi. She bushfire in Swaziland? Yes. Yeah. She went back and started a thing called the Festival, Festival Institute, and their whole goal is to train us as Africans in all of the things that go beyond these fest festivals, because so often people from outside bring these festivals, they do them, they hire a few of us, lots of money is made, and then they bounce, and we're left with huge stadiums all over South Africa or <laughs> whatever it is that's, that's happening, right? Somehow the local people don't get to capitalize on all of these new skills. And so she's building something where that's possible. And we're trying to incorporate the idea that women need parity in all of that. And so it was fascinating working with young women, man. Like they were geniuses with this stuff, um, quick studies and totally anxious to learn. And so my consistency right now is to try to be where we can get new ideas to new sets of people. Man, it's so good to see you. <laughs> I think that's one thing. <laughs> All right, good to see you too. Yeah, before this uh, you know, interview took place, when you walked in here, I just thought, yeah, it just sort of took me back to, to an era. And you're looking good, brother. Hey, man, same with you. <laughs> you know, I don't know what it is. Uh, right? Somebody feeding you well at home or what? Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm being well fed. Yeah, yeah. I'm being well fed and, you know, exercising, trying to keep, yeah. uh, trying to keep uh, the mind sharp, you know? And uh, my children are often my greatest teachers these days. Yeah. You know? I so, find that too. Yeah, no. yeah. Yeah. If I know my son is the one who will bring me the JID, JIDs and the Travis Scotts and, the, you know, making sure I know what's happening. And I'm you not, listen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We listen together. My son will listen to De La Soul with me. I will listen to JID with him. Yeah. We're checking out who's doing what and who's and why they're doing it. You know, we'll criticize the Drake album together and decide if we like what he's doing or do, don't, don't, you know? Yeah. Yeah, at all points, we, there's a lot of spaces where... But Willy Hotsisila's son is doing well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Earl Sweatshirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah. you go. Earl is, Earl is sick. He's an incredible MC. I don't know Earl, which is yeah. crazy, because he's from a younger generation he is, in L.A. He's quite young, yeah. But I love his mind and his, um, 
his passion, he also seems to be coming to that space where he's coming our way eventually. You know, he's going to be down here having to figure out what his story was just the same way I had to be down here figuring out what my story was. And there's a lot of us on that side who have roots here who I hope will come back because for me, this has been great. Like being in South Africa gave me a career. I couldn't have had a career anywhere else. Oh, yeah. Nah. They didn't like me in the States. I was too rebellious. Every song was about, you know, screw this system. How do we bring this down? Oppression, blah, blah. They're like, nah. South Africa was like, sure. Sure. <laughs> Bring that. <laughs> Bring that. Yeah. Brother, yeah, I think uh, you've made an impact and you, you know you have. Continue building um, y your work and, and work still to come. You know, it, it doesn't go unseen. And, and some of us who were there in that era um, still absorb. And, uh, you know, we're teaching the younger generations just about the input you guys have brought. And uh, I really appreciate the time. Uh, to come to House of Sankofa and really just uh, sort of outline a little bit of uh, your history. So from the House of Sankofa, uh, we'd just like to say uh, thank you so much for coming through. Ziko Mokwambir. Ah, Ziko Mokwambir. Ziko Mokwambir. Yeah, give thanks. <laughs>